I'm Rory Smith, a broadcaster and interviewer. Everyone has a story of challenges and triumphs throughout life, and there's lessons to be learned from everyone's experience. That is why I'm asking each person I meet, what's your story? Ian was a successful businessman. He had his own company. He had his own house. He was an able-bodied man. This was until 2006 when he met his now former girlfriend, Michelle, who domestically abused him. These attacks included everything from burning to hitting him to even sexual assault. This went on for a total of 14 months. He says that by the end of those 14 months, he was a changed man and barely recognised himself. Although he still has the scars from that time, he's now speaking out in order to help other people. Here is Ian's story. Tell me about your relationship with Michelle in, say, the first few months that you were with her. What was it like? So when I first met Michelle, it was just a a normal, very relaxed relationship. Um, of different ideas of normal, but there, there were no signs there at all as to what was going to evolve. She was a small lady, just five foot four, seven and a half stone, slim built, relaxed, sense of humour, which was a bit quirky. Mm-hmm. Nothing whatsoever. Mm-hmm. If we fast forward four or five months into the relationship and it's just... Mm. Was there a grooming process during that time as well? That's a really interesting phrase. So when I think back to that initial period, I do use this phrase grooming. And what I mean by that is that she she built me up to feel like a king. Uh, you know, I'm not somebody who smokes. I'm not a, a regular drinker. And she spoke about, you know, you, you don't go out and get drunk. You, you, you don't smoke. You don't do drugs. Um, She spoke about how in some ways she felt quite lucky, but not in a not in a uh, not in a humbling way, but just I like to think I'm a decent guy. You know, I've got faults like anybody quirks, but she just she made me feel better about myself and she made me feel really good about me and her. That Mm -hmm. was what she did. Mm -hmm. And how far into the relationship was the first attack? So I, I met Michelle on the 1st of October and it was in the middle of February. So just some over four and a half months. Mm. And she'd, she'd told me uh, that there'd been this argument at home. She lived in the Midlands. I was in Lincolnshire. Would I mind if she stayed on at my property for a little bit longer? And of course, that wasn't a problem by then. I, I thought she will tell me about this problem when it's right for her. I didn't push her on it. And she was hoovering up. In, in my front room and I was just relaxed reading the paper and she just very innocently asked me what was the last sexual act you performed with your last girlfriend and I I laughed and I sort of made a bit of a joke of it and in a flash she just unscrewed this hoover pipe and whack like my head was a rounders ball mm. and I've still got the scar here and she just started ranting and raving I've got an effing right to know Mm-hmm. And and she, so she's, she wanted to know, was she taller than me? What was her hair colour? Was she slimmer than her? Was she bigger than her? And of course, in that moment, the absolute shock, then fear of, my God, what is going to happen next? And I just blurted anything out. Just give her back anything. And then eventually, she just stopped as if somebody did a pause button. She walks into the kitchen, she took the blood off the hoover pipe, put it back together and carried on. And it was as if those few moments had just never happened. What was going through your head? Well, first, the, the absolute shock. Oh, my God. You know, what's what in that first moment, when this, when this hoover pipe connects here, this stinging sensation was, was unbelievable. And I obviously realised that my eye had, had, had split. Never looked at her. Don't say anything. Don't do anything. God, this will just stop. It will blow over. Please, it will blow over. Answer a question. Spare it out really quickly. And then, when she went into the kitchen, I didn't sit. I didn't move. 
And it goes back to your previous question, which is part of this grooming process. I realised in that moment that she'd cut me off from friends and family. So just to put that into context, I was somebody who was travelling around the country with running my own business. Mm -hmm. It wasn't unusual, and of course you knew this by now, that I would go three, four, sometimes six weeks before I would see friends. My family, which consisted of just my dad and my brother, mum had passed years before, lived 40 miles away. The neighbourhood was quite a small street with only maybe nine or ten houses in it. And when my friends were calling, she would always, when I looked back, make an excuse to get me off the phone so she would... I now know she'd pretend that she'd put her hands under the, she'd run the water and it was boiling hot and she'd shout, Ian, I've, I've burnt myself, I've burnt myself. And, and unbeknown to me, the final strand, she was sending messages to friends mm -hmm. saying that I needed money back that I'd lent to them. And of course I hadn't. So that combination, this grooming process, it's about manipulation and I've tried to explain an example. She was manipulating friendships. Mm -hmm. Once she'd started to manipulate, I was isolated. And once I was isolated, she had control. Did any of your friends or family suspect anything was going on? Well, my, obviously, my, my, my family were remote. So they were some 40 miles away. I, I, I didn't see them that much because just because of the nature of my lifestyle. There's nothing more than that. So... And also, we, did, we you know we didn't speak that often, but in effect, she'd cut me off completely. So going back to that moment of that first assault, because she'd started to manipulate calls and, in effect, telling untruths, those calls became far less infrequent till they eventually stopped. Mm -hmm. So again, at the point of the assault, I was not having telephone conversations with the people who were in my life, my small circle of friends. And when you've stopped speaking to people, two things is you think, well, I haven't spoke to somebody for a while. I don't feel as though I can contact them. And having not been in that situation, if I made contact, how would I bring that subject up? And after that first attack, did you confront her in any way or ask her why or what that was about earlier? So the, obviously after the assault, we, we get into the thing of what, why didn't you leave? I didn't know where to turn. I didn't know where to go or what to do. After the assault, I didn't say anything. She carried on as normal. And I then realised, my God, I'm on my own. Mm -hmm. I've become a prisoner in my own home in a split second. Mm -hmm. well, did, well, that start the contrast. What did you fear would be the consequences if you were to speak out. So here's the next stage. So after the assault, she goes back to normal. I'm not saying anything. I, do, I, I literally just don't speak to her in, in case I'm going to make her angry. And then quite quickly, she showed me some crimes that had gone on in the Midlands where she was from and tells me that she's got brothers in organised crime. And these crimes that she's showing me, they've definitely taken place. She's telling me her brothers have been involved in this. They're running the doors and the pubs. These are seriously violent guys. And, of course, here's part of the manipulation and the control. There's no pictures of her brothers. And even if there were pictures of her brothers, I'd not met them at this point. So I didn't know whether that was them or they could have been anybody. Mm -hmm. And I'm given a, a clear choice. If you make any attempt to leave, I'll tell my brothers that you've done something and they'll kill you. So it's a really easy decision. Mm -hmm. Leave and be killed or stay. Start staying. It was did that she, simple. Did she show any remorse for what she did for that first attack? Ab absolutely nothing. And this would become a real pattern of Michelle's behaviour where she wiped the hoover pipe and just carried on. And it was as if the bit in between from hoovering to the assault to going back, that had just been erased. It was like a joined up movie with that clip taken out of it. And that night, whenever you went to bed, 
what was going through your head? Did you have fear that this could continue? So each each night when I go to bed, I've I've broken my day down in three pieces. Get through the morning without any violence, get through the afternoon without any violence, and go to bed when I'm told. So by now, thinking about going to bed, there's actually, again, there's lots of stuff going on. So what I'd ask anybody watching this to imagine, just, just imagine that tomorrow your day will start when you are told. So you'll be woken up. It might be five o'clock. It could be 10 o'clock in the morning, depending on what time you've gone to bed the night before, if at all. And again, when you're allowed to go to sleep, you wake up. You, you ask permission to make a drink. You ask permission to go to the toilet. You eat what you're given when you're given. You are, in effect, an object. Again, the analogy, you're the television. Michelle's got the remote control. She's played with all the settings, brightness, volume. So I'm, I'm, I'm just not, I've become nothing overnight. Mm. So going to bed at the night time was... Absolutely, I've got through the day without any violence, but a real strong part of her behavior, I'll just talk, is a really strong trait. So I now know, looking back, that she would put off the bedside lamp, I had the same lamp on, on my side of the bed, and she would be listening to me breathing. When my breathing started to go heavier, so I'm tired because I'm, my sleep pattern's all over the place, She'd put the light on in a flash and she'd be stood on the bed and she would either sink her teeth in the top of my head. She would have a mobile phone in her hand that she would ram into my cheekbones had been fractured multiple times. Or she'd punch or kick or stamp on my privates or on my stomach or on my face. And she'd just say, here's another night where you haven't instigated sex and you haven't told me today that you loved me. You've now got five minutes to be ready. Now, at that point, I feel my eyes closing where she slammed a mobile into it, or I've got blood coming out my nose or my mouth, or I'm in excruciating pain because she's stomped on my privates. Mm -hmm. And she sat there with a watch, and she's made me stand at the end of the bed, and I'm having to masturbate to get ready to have sex. And she's looking at a watch and looking at me like this. Come on, she said. Only four minutes and 20 seconds. There's not a lot happening. This pressure of this time scale of the countdown. And she's going through it at 30, 60 second intervals at her leisure, at her will. And of course, at the end of the five minutes, when I, I first of all, I don't want to have sex with her. I don't love her. I don't want to have sex with her. At the end of the five minutes, and this is another example, she completely forgets the assault. And so when I'm not physically able to have sex, there's the proof that you don't find me attractive. You've never loved me. You've lied to me. And there'll be a second, much more violent assault. There'll be a second, much more violent assault. Mm -hmm. So not the fact that I can't have sex with you. I don't want to have sex with you. Because my eyes closing, I'm in pain where your teeth are in my being sunk in my head, or I've got blood going down the back of my throat. That's not a factor in her mind, mm. and that's been erased. So there'd be a more severe assault. And I remember one time, she just picked a portable TV up in the bedroom and just slammed it on my head. Mm -hmm. Got one of the photos with blood all over the television. Mm. Because we're going to take you through a couple of photos now as well. Is this the one with the bedroom that we're talking about, with the blood-stained bedroom? Yeah, so there's there's a lot of blood in in, in the bedroom. And uh, what, what you'll see, there's there's blood on the pillow. There's a, a shot where there's a, there's a claw mark down the wall, where after a beating, I'd literally just slid down the wall to the floor. And I had blood coming out my nose and my mouth, which has gone onto my hands. And you see my, my blood-stained paw print mm. just sliding down the wall. And the blood on the bed is from multiple assaults. It's not, mm -hmm. not just one. 
And, you know, it, it would be very easy for me to ask what was going through your head at that time or how are you feeling? But were you almost so exhausted by this stage that the feeling was lost, that you had no feeling? Yeah, if, it, it, you basically are in survival mode and it's do as you're told, speak when you're told. You become your hermit-like because the only time you go out is to buy some cigarettes for Michelle after the assault. The only time I'm going out of property. You're not hearing any other voice. And then obviously when you hear that voice, you're being told what to do, or you're being told, well, I don't know why you're wearing that shirt, but you put weight on you. God, that shirt makes you look fat. That color makes you look pasty. Oh, you've lost a lot of weight. That You look really, God, you're almost emaciated. Mm. So whatever you wore, so there's this one voice going around and you know it's you know it's it's verbal abuse. It's emotional, mm. psychological. And you're only functioning based on what you've told. So you haven't got time to think to make a plan other than if I leave, I'm gonna be killed. So I'm staying and all I'm trying to do is is get from wake up time to at the end of the morning. Mm -hmm. From from midday to five, six o'clock. And then from six o'clock, that's all I'm trying to do. I'm just trying to survive. Mm -hmm. Nothing more than that. Here's another photo that we're about to see. This is a picture of a stairwell and there's a hammer towards the middle of it. And it's sort of, it seems like half a hammer. How did this happen? So when, when, when you look at that, and there's one of the messages to the police, I guess, when they're going into a crime scene, it's about being professionally curious. But for me, what that is, it became exhibit A. So what turned out to be the last assault, which lasted just over six hours, actually, and only ended because Michelle was fatigued. Um, I, I was sat in the chair. She had got quite verbally abusive. She had uh, previously branded me with a red hot iron, which we may come on to. But this assault with the hammer, the first, she got me to stand up. The first strike was put into my head and I know she fractured my skull the second strike was driven into my side and she fractured some ribs and the third strike was delivered with such ferocity and I asked her to remember this is a, a female who was five foot one and seven and a half stone she delivered it with such force into this shoulder the hammer broke and that's what you see in the image and if I put my arm in a certain way I've got a permanent indentation from that hammerhead in my shoulder. Did you go to hospital after any of these? No, so I was always denied medical help. The, the only time that Michelle sought medical help on my behalf before I was rescued by the police was when she poured a kettle of water over my groin, not once but twice. And she rang a local pharmacist and said there'd been an accident in the home with a pan of water. Was it possible to deliver some uh, gauzes and burn cream and it would be paid for upon delivery so again of course she controlled that situation she went to the door took delivery paid for it and then just slung these gauzes and cream at me in a bag and said sort yourself out the next time I got medical attention was when I was rescued this is another photo and I think you briefly mentioned it just then about the Aaron is this burns on your arm yeah, yeah. so what what we've got here and uh, th this assault just took 30 seconds. And again, just to give people an insight into this psychological control. So it took Michelle just 30 seconds. She, she branded me with a red hot iron on my lower forearm, between my shoulder blades, and on my upper right arm, I've got a triangle of the, of the iron where it took the pigmentation off my skin. So she was ironing away in the living room, started to get aggressive again, saying, you don't listen, you don't tell me you love me. And she, she asked me to stand up and she'd punched me in the face. And then she said to me, and people will understand why I did it, but uh, sorry, won't understand why I did it. She said to me, take, take your effing T-shirt off or else I'll steam your face. Now, when I look back on this and I slow it down, you think if anybody said that to you, why would you do that? You would make some, some attempt to get out. And we go back to, you know, I'm not safe to leave the property. I'm going to be killed. So whatever's going on in there is not worse than death. And she tells me to take my T-shirt off or she's going to steam my face. 
So I take my T-shirt off in a flash. And the reason why I do that is I have absolutely no doubt if I don't take my T-shirt off, she'll steam my face. And I'm thinking, this is the only one I've got. Do you know what, Michelle? If you want to chop a finger off, it's not a problem. I've still got nine. If you chop an arm off, I'll still have one. But I've only got one face. So I took my T-shirt off in a flash and it was just like that. It was that quick. And then she walked into the kitchen. She run the iron. I had the tap go. She run it under a tap, presumably because there was some skin on there. And just carried on ironing. Again, it was as if it hadn't happened. And I was in unbelievable pain. And I know why she, she did what she did. You then go to sleep. I can't lay on my back because I've been branded with an iron. Mm. I can't lay on this side because I've got a branding mark there. And I can't lay on this side because I've got a branding mark there. And I couldn't lay on my front because my nose had been fractured and broken that many times. If I laid on my front with my mouth closed sleeping, I would, I'm not getting any oxygen. I'd wake up with a pounding headache. So I, I slept somehow in the least painful position. She mm. cherry picked where she actually put the iron. Mm. And in those 14 months that the attacks and abuse was going on, how many attacks do you think you went through? Well, certainly we were two, two or three assaults a week. If I think about the multiple physical assaults, how many times did Michelle come into contact with my body physically? If I said a thousand, there'd be nowhere cooking it. Nowhere. I'm undercooking that. When I think in one assault, she'd bite, she'd punch, she'd spit, she'd slam a phone in my face, she put cigarettes up my nose. My house was a weapons armory, but it was two or three times a week. And did you, did, because these are all quite physical as well, so there are the scars, the cuts, there may be bruises. Did people around the town, whenever you were going for the cigarettes, did anyone notice those things? So after an assault, you're in agony, you're in pain, you're glad it's over, you're still alive. Mm -hmm. But instead of the remorse and the apology, Michelle repeatedly sends me out to go and buy a cigarette straight away. And I describe it's like a, an artist who's just finished a painting. Look what I've done. I want to show it off. So now you think, brilliant, you, you're going to be able to tell somebody. The minute I step foot outside the property, there's a mobile phone in this hand. And Michelle has called me off the landline to the mobile before I've even left the front doorstep. So she's now talking to me on the mobile phone. And she knows how long it should take me to go into the shops. So I can't speak to anybody to say, please call the police. So what I started to do. She'd be saying, come on, what's going on? You're taking your time. There's a queue, there's a queue, Michelle. There's three or four people in front of me. I've, I've just got a queue to get you cigarettes. You know they're behind the till. But what I was doing was I'd walk around the store and I remember I used to pick up either a little bag of Maltesers or this small tube of After Eights. And I would have them in this hand. She couldn't see me. It wasn't a video call. And I'd hold them up looking at the assistant and make no attempt to pay for them. And I'd put them in my coat pocket. I'd get to the checkout. Can I have this brand of cigarette, please? Make no attempt to offer to pay for them. Because what I'm really doing is, you lock the store, call the police and have me for shoplifting. And I've got an escape route. But they never, ever did it. And I did that time after time after time. And they never once challenged me, even though it was the same shop assistant. So why did she not intervene? Mm. Why did he not intervene? I'm walking around in the neighborhood. It's a no more than a two minute walk from my house to the shop. And people see me, but they cross on the other side of the road. Mm. I don't know what they thought I was going to do. I was the one who was a physical wreck. I'd lost 25% of my body weight. Mm. How did your like I had a plague? It was like I had the plague. Right. And in, in the 14 months from the Ian at the start of that to the Ian at the end of it, what was the difference? Well, if you think before I met Michelle, um, I was a picture of health. I had a close circle of friends. I was content with life and I was running my own business. 
by the time I'm rescued, although I didn't know all of this at the time, but the migration, I've lost 25% of my body weight. I was a physical and mental wreck. Now, the mental wreck, eventually I come up with a plan. And that plan is to commit suicide. Mm -hmm. And there's a reason for it. I already know if I leave, I'm going to be killed. So I felt it was safer to stay. But I'm now in the point where the violence and the abuse is so frequent and so ferocious. She's going to kill me. In fact, what turned out to be the last assault, she told me she was going to kill me. So a few days before I decided the only way out of this is to take my own life. Just imagine that thought. Everything you value, your life is so unrecognizable. Everything you value has been completely eroded. That you have a stark choice of stay in your house and be beaten and abused physically, emotionally, psychologically, sexually, because the other choice is to leave and be killed. But now you feel as though you're going to be killed in the only place where you felt not safe, but you were just trying to manage your life as best you was. And now you know you're going to be killed because the violence is getting worse. So you're going to take your own life. You're going to blow out your own candle. I planned it. How did the police intervene? So what turned out to be the last assault, Michelle followed her behaviour, sent me out to the shops. Remember, it was just just before six o'clock in the morning. That's when the shop opened. And for a long time, The police turned up from what I believed was an anonymous call from somebody in the neighbourhood. Now, I I know that somebody saw me. I was in a most unbelievable state. My hair was down on my shoulders and it was matted with blood from this last assault. I now know that three houses down, some very good friend's daughter had a boyfriend and he worked in the Navy. He was on a submarine. And obviously conversations had started taking place in the neighbourhood that I had no knowledge of. She was pregnant. He was a young lad in his 20s. And I met him a few years ago. And it was unbelievably emotional. And he was really honest. And I said to him, thank you very much for contacting the police. You saved my life. And he said, Ian, I've got to be honest. I was hearing what Michelle was doing. It was getting worse and worse. And my thought was, my God, what if she does that to my girlfriend? We've got a baby on the way. Mm. He said, I'm going to be honest. I got in touch with the police because I was worried about my girlfriend and my baby. Mm. And that phone call saved my life. So the police intervened. They were very, very skillful. They removed me from the property, which I'm happy to talk about in terms of how I came to disclose what happened. But then two things happened that, are hugely problematic. Mm. One is that, bear in mind, I was the sole homeowner of my property. We were not married. We had no children. But Michelle was bailed back to my house. She was the perpetrator. Mm. That would never happen if it was a male perpetrator and a female victim. Where did you stay? So the police take me to the station um, police do what's called a body map. They have to capture your injuries. And this police surgeon says, look, this guy's in a really bad way. You need to get him to hospital. So he stopped doing what he was doing. Police transfer me to a hospital out of town. They take me out of Lincolnshire. I'm in A&E for eight hours. I now know they keep me in because they were looking at amputating this arm. Mm. And then astonishingly, The next morning I wake up believing I'm in a refuge and I find that police have dropped me at a night shelter for the homeless. So I wake up the next day. I've got a fractured skull. I've got fractured ribs. I've got fractured cheekbones. This arm is the colour of a plum. It is purple from here down to my wrist. And I'm in excruciating pain. But worse than that, I now know in 10 minutes I'm going to be on the streets. I'm being pursued by Michelle. And she's got these brothers in organised crime and they're going to find me and kill me. In tandem, Michelle's bailed back to my house. How could that possibly happen? And the challenge today 
could it happen again? Mm. And to believe it could happen again. Do you think it would have happened if you were a female victim? Absolutely not. Because clearly as part of my initial interview, I had to confirm, are you married? No. Have you got kids? No. Whose house is it? Mine. That was easily found. So why would you then bail somebody back to a house they don't own? Got no right to be there. Mm. And and let's put that into perspective, because if you are standing there that following morning that you just slept in a homeless shelter and you're literally standing at that front door that following day, what support did you have or did you know that you have? So at that point, I have a stark choice and it genuinely is, you know, and I don't apologise for repeating it. When I step outside of that door, I'm being hunted. So I said to the lady who was on the reception, I'd had a letter from the, a little note from the police and it, it said basically, you know, this is a very serious domestic abuse case. It needs to go to Amarac, which is a multi-agency risk assessment. So I showed that because I thought it was a different member of staff probably. I'll show, look, I've got this from the police. Can you help me? She says, the only thing I can suggest for you to get somewhere is go to the Salvation Army and ask her where it is. So she gives me the directions and it's about a 10 minute walk. Now, again, just imagine, you think, what a relief it must have been to be out of that property. I've had some medical care. I've had painkillers. I've got some medication. I've now got to walk 10 minutes thinking that every car, every person who I see could be her brothers. Every car that stopped, every car door that slammed, every boot that was opened, is somebody going to get out and put me in it? That 10 minutes felt like I was walking a marathon backwards. And I get to the Salvation Army, I show them the letter, and they very, very kindly said, look, we can bring you in here. You'll stay on the assessment suite. You'll have seven to ten days. What you need to do is we'll help you get in touch with the council because you have to pay for your accommodation. I wasn't working, so I'm then thrust straight into the benefit system. I have to get housing benefit from the council to pay for my accommodation with the Salvation Army. And I show the letter to the council now, at that point, what the council could and should have done, is there a refuge space? Yes. Is there any capacity? No. Where are we going to put this guy? Because he's a victim of domestic abuse. He shouldn't be in a Salvation Army hostel, which is a cocktail of people with complex needs. But what I can say, had the Salvation Army not taken me in that day, I would not be talking with you now. I would have gone and committed suicide. I would have followed through what was in my mind. I'd planned it for a few days, ironically, before what turned out to be the last assault. So the Salvation Army said I couldn't stay. I wouldn't have known where to go. They saved my life. Where, where do you go to start, in your case, rebuilding your life whenever you're there in that first week of the Salvation Army? I breathe the most unbelievable sigh of relief. Mm. Now, here's in my mind. So I'm going into an assessment suite of the Salvation Army, a really big hostel that's you know got complex needs of many people in there. And I'm looking at this. I'm in an assessment suite that's got security codes to get in and I'm given the codes where there's a maximum of six people. And honestly, I'm, I'm in a five-star holiday resort. That is how it felt. I've been living my day by the morning, the afternoon and the evening. And I've got a minimum of seven and a maximum of 10 days on the assessment suite while things like housing benefit are claimed and put in place. They check my weight, make sure I'm eating. Except I'm in a five star hotel. That's what it felt like. Mm. And then I get a golden piece of advice from Grant Piri, who was the investigating officer. And he came to see me. One of the first things I did was I went to get my hair cut the next the next day, actually. And he came to see me and he said to me, 
obviously gathering, get ready to do statements and things. But he said to me, look, and it was the best piece of advice I'd ever been given. What you've seen and seen with your own eyes and heard with your own ears, you are absolutely entitled to form an opinion on. And what I'd like you to think about is make a list, write it down or just think about it. What you've seen and heard with your own ears and what you've not seen or heard. So in other words, what Michelle was telling me somebody said. And what he did in a really subtle way was I began to separate what I knew and what I didn't know. So I didn't know if she had two brothers or five brothers, if they were in organised crime or not. I knew that she'd assaulted me with an eye and I knew she'd broke my nose. I knew she'd fractured my skull. So suddenly this thick fog that I'm living in is not quite as dense. And then I'm now being controlled, actually, but in a really positive way. So I've lived in this controlling environment and I now see very quickly the signs between negative control and positive because the positive control is the police saying, we're going to call you at, say, one o'clock tomorrow afternoon and we're going to come out and see you and take a statement. Can you make sure you're in this building at quarter to two to mm -hmm. do your statement? Can you please make sure the doctor's surgery is saying, oh, I had to register with, you come in twice a day to get the dressing changed on your arm because it was badly. So I'm now still being told what to do, but it's all for me. It's all for my benefit. Was it was it hard for you to trust those people who wanted to control you in a positive way? Well, there's two things, actually. <laughs> the first thing I observed, I remember saying this, because obviously when I was taken into A and E, I was being put into contact with different people, but I wasn't. I never saw a female nurse, and I remember saying, "Where's all the female nurses? Are they all on night off?" Well, no. We 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 assumed that you you wouldn't want to be seen by a female. So for me, I was I was sort of kept away from females until I said, "Well, I'm okay actually," and that was because. You know, I had trust and respect for the police uniform, trust and respect for the nurse uniform. These were people that, as a young boy growing up, they helped fix you when you were sick. They kept you safe if you were out and about in your community. Mm -hmm. So it was the uniform that I was looking at, not the not the gender of the person. Mm. Did you have to face Michelle in court? Well, here's the thing. So if we just look back a moment, of course, Michelle's been bailed back to my house. I then have to go and get what's called an, an occupation order to get my own house back. I know what injuries she's caused. I know she intended to kill me because she told me. And I'm faced with the very real probability of coming face to face with her in a civil court to get my own house back. And I was absolutely terrified undiluted fear of coming face to face with this woman who had the intention to kill me and that all came about because police bailed her to my own house now that was three weeks after i was rescued the trial takes a year so we now move forward and i'm in a really different space i've prepared as best i can and it might sound strange but as a young boy growing up I followed Muhammad Ali's career very, very closely. I remember how he had his title stripped away from him because he wouldn't go and fight in Vietnam. And in my mind, going into that trial, I was Ali coming out of retirement. I was going to tell my story. I was going to show the court that what had happened to me was wrong and I could prove it. And I was going to talk about it. And on the morning of the trial, I was introduced to my barrister. He asked me how I was feeling. He said, you know, you're going to have to ask to answer difficult questions. You're going to be challenged by a barrister. When you go into the court, don't look at Michelle. And when you're answering the questions, talk to the jury. It's the only piece of advice I ignored. And I said to him, before you go, I've got one question for you. He said, yeah, he said, what is it? I'll help. I said, you know, I know we're going to have to talk about when she bent 
me with the iron. He said, yeah, you are. He said, and just let me tell you, if at any point you want a break, you say to the judge, you need to a break, we'll adjourn. You want some water, you ask for water. Take your time. I said, no, that's not what I wanted to ask you. When you ask me the question, do I ask you or the judge if I can step out of the witness box because I want to walk in front of the jury and take my shirt out of its sleeve and show them? And he just looked at me and he said, you're going to be okay. He said, I'd never even thought of that. He said, and that's unbelievably powerful. But if when the question comes, you don't feel as though you want to do it, don't ask the question. But if you feel able, you ask, you direct your question to the judge. And when I walked into the courtroom, Michelle was stood in the, stood in the dock. And I just looked straight at her in the eye. And I just said, this is my time. And I walked in to the witness box and I stood there for over two days taking questions, reliving every detail. Mm. Where did you find the strength to do that? The strength came from that I knew, firstly, what happened to me was wrong. I labelled myself subconsciously, I'm just a victim of crime. Although she told me I was an idiot, I was an imbecile, it was my fault. By the time I'm coming to trial, that voice is gone. I knew. And I knew I could go in there and answer every question. In the same way, if I think back when I was a kid at school, subject I didn't like was religious education. Imagine facing an exam on a subject that you really don't like and you've got no interest in, but you already know what the questions are. I knew there was nothing that I couldn't be asked that I couldn't answer. I'd lived with this woman for 24 hours a day for 14 months. I knew her inside out. I knew what had happened. I had the proof. I had the marks that I could not be tripped up. Mm. So when I walked into that witness box, I was ready. I was so ready. I'd been to some other courts and I'd gone into other courts just to watch how it worked. I'd been given the option to look around the courtroom when it was empty. And whilst nothing can prepare you for it in that context, they're going to give evidence where your life actually is going to be on the spin of a coin, guilty or not guilty. I was prepared in the sense of I just knew that whatever I was asked, I could answer. Mm. And that's how I prepared. I was a victim of crime. As the police began to put the case together, it then fell into this little compartment called domestic abuse. And then you see the gravitas of it. I'm no cartoon character. I'm Ian McNichol. And the jury's going to see what Michelle's done because I'm going to roll my sleeve and show. Mm. Look at And that was partly about showing I was strong and I was ready, as mm. ready as I could possibly be. And she was sentenced in, I've got it here, she was sentenced in 2009. That was for seven years. And she was later released in 2012. Whenever you walked out of that courtroom, what was the feeling? Well, the first thing I was told when the guilty plea came was that the next day you may get a reaction. And I thought, well, yeah, it will be one of euphoria, probably. I woke up the next day and I swear it was as if a bomb had completely... Ex I had the worst headache, unbelievable headache. Nothing I took made any difference. And I remember just sleeping for hours and hours and hours intermittently putting ice on my head. So then the next step is, she's been found guilty. I'm still in the Salvation Army hostel. I'm trapped in the benefit system. I wonder how many people this has happened to. So I made an inquiry, found out from the police quite quickly with the help of Grant. My God, that's just one police force. What about the people going to the doctor's surgeries, to A&E? Mm. I want to tell my story. It's been to trial. Why is it important for you to share your story? Well, when I think, firstly, obviously, I, I wish what happened to me didn't happen, but it has. It's changed my life. I, I had to reset and revisit all of my values because they've been eroded away. It's simply, for me, saying... I can't change what's happened to me, but by talking very, very honestly and open about what happened, 
what worked well, what didn't work well, what effect it had on my life, my physical appearance. If that means that one person contacts the police or one man or woman who's concerned about somebody in their workplace, their neighbourhood, makes that call to the police and that intervention allows that person to escape, then that's life changing. And it could even be life saving. I don't want anybody to go through anything remotely what I went through because I know what it feels like. I've met female victims and we talk and it's so similar, mm -hmm. so similar, certainly when it comes to the emotions. It's individual, it's personal, but there's striking similarities. Mm. I speak out in the hope that I would just say to anybody watching this, if you're in an abusive relationship, I absolutely get what it's like to have zero trust, to be so low on confidence about yourself. But please just find the strength to either contact the police or confide in someone because that call that you made today will be life changing. I'll guarantee you it will be life changing. And to anybody who's worried about someone, use the domestic violence disclosure scheme if you want. If you're really worried or make the call to the police. What if you're really worried about them or in your case, a circle of family members or friends of them coming after you? Well, again, I mean, there's, there is lots of things you do. We, we go back to the police. There are things that can be put in place. So if, if you're either in your own property or you're relocating, there are what's known as target hardening measures. But it is also about people looking out for people in that tight knit family environment. So if the person is remote and they're not in the same town, you can agree that they're going to call you at a certain time or send you a text message with a code word that says, you know, I'm safe, I'm OK. And what would you do if that message was not received? So you'd have an agreement that if you don't hear from me at midday with the code word of X, you call the police, particularly because we know when relationships separate, that's when the level of risk does heighten. So there's lots of things. There's advice from the police. There are other professionals working in the profession that would give you a much more broader set of things that you can do to keep yourself safe. Mm. Psychologically, how did you learn to stop looking over your shoulder? It took time, and that's being honest. It took a great deal of time. But what, what I started to do was to begin to recognise that, actually, before I even step outside, I chose what trousers to wear today, the colour, the style, the T-shirt or the long sleeve top, how to cut my hair, when to brush my teeth, what to eat. So I've got a choice to go outside. I've got a plan as to what I can do if I don't feel safe. I've got this panic alarm. I've got the mobile phone. And I made sure that I started to do something every single day, whether it was walking somewhere slightly different at a different time. And when you go out at a different time and come back at a different time and take a different route, it's like opening up a whole new map. And all of the routes and all of the decisions are made by you. And so you begin to just be, feel more confident in yourself. You're less stressed, you're less anxious because you're the one making the choice. Are you in a relationship today? At this moment in time, no, but I have had a relationship since uh, Michelle. That's not changed that at all. Clearly, in a relationship, as with any other new relationship, you have to build up trust. And that just takes a little bit longer. Mm -hmm. But it can be done. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Is there a difference between a domestic abuse victim and a survivor? There is, absolutely. Well, firstly, yes, there's a major contrast in the context of as a, as a victim. All of your values are eroded, some are erased. As a survivor, you've had to find those again to reinstate them. But actually, 
when you go through that experience of being a victim to survivor, you come back much mentally stronger. And I think because you become a more rounded person psychologically you have more empathy certainly something that i've you know developed you have more empathy because i I wouldn't have had a clue about domestic abuse before i experienced it so if it ever was talked about i had no knowledge of it it wasn't something that i ever even thought about i've had to reinstate my values i've learned some new values i've grown but the key is that the two the two lives are just unrecognisable. I asked the question earlier, how Ian changed from the start of the 14 month period to the Ian at the end in the shop, still in the Maltesers. I'll ask it again. How has the Ian changed from the man in the shop with the Maltesers to the man today? Well, firstly, if we just, the, the, I, I use this Doctor Who analogy. So I was a businessman running my own business, homeowner, unmarked, able-bodied. By the time I leave Michelle and I'm rescued, 14 months and does three decades of lifestyle and career choices. I lose my business, I lose my house, I become registered disabled, I've got multiple scars. Today, I've still got the multiple scars. It's not the same me as the me before Michelle, but the me today is absolutely unrecognisable from the me that was with Michelle. So I still have the scars physically, but I'm now, I'm back, I speak out, I share my opinions, I've uh, become, I've reset my values. So the values, I think that what's right in a relationship are there. I just feel a little bit more stronger about that. The things I believe are wrong in a relationship are still there. I feel a little bit more stronger about that. But the Ian today, does not live in any fear at all. The Ian today wants to reach out and help other people in the same way as I used to. But I talk about a unique time in my life that won't be repeated, that I've learned from, and I'm just here to tell my story to help others. That's what it's about.